Got the notice. Thank you. And you didn't leave, Larry. All right. Good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Coastal Resiliency Steering Committee meeting. Uh, I, most of us received a copy of a draft Coastal Resiliency Plan, and our intent is to uh, get an overview from Chris and others on the uh, Coastal Resiliency Working Group and talk a little bit about uh, kind of how this document is put together and maybe share some thoughts. I know we all haven't had a lot of time to review it yet, so I will. I know I'm going to need some additional time to review this, but uh, hopefully tonight Chris can walk us through and provide a little bit of an overview of this document so we and maybe guide us onto some areas that we should concentrate our efforts as we look at this and then we will talk about a time when we can get back together and share those comments and uh, discuss it in more detail. Anybody have any questions before we get started tonight? Hearing none, I'll, uh, Chris, I'd uh, kind of flip it back over to you if you want to kind of tee up and give us a little bit of an overview of uh, what we distributed last night. Okay, sure. Um, I'll take the committee through the, the draft, um, moving pretty quickly through the first couple chapters and then focusing on chapter four, which is the recommendations. Um, but please stop me at any point. Um, Before you get started, can I, one thing that did jump at me, I, I, is the intent to have a table of contents in there when we get put that together? Yes, and an acknowledgement page and um, okay. some other kind of conventional report. Okay. That. Definitely. Yep. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Um, so the introduction is little changed from the, uh, I'm gonna share my screen right now. The, the introduction is, is really not changed from the version that you saw um, some time ago. I guess it was last month. Um, I think we just let Wayne into the uh, the meeting. Hi, Wayne. Good to, good to see you. Um, so, hi everybody. I've been here just on my phone. I'm back on my computer now. Okay, good. Um, so I, I won't speak to the introduction, but move right through to some of the the existing conditions. Um, there were, uh, there's a, a focus on describing the environmental context uh, in Chesapeake Beach and laying out one of the main observations, and that being that over many decades, the town has developed within the, um, the inlets to the bay for two, two uh, creeks, the South Creek, which is on the north side of town and Fishing Creek, which is in the center part of town. And this photograph aptly describes that relationship between development and the natural resource base. Uh, you can see the South, South Creek meandering through, the, through its marsh coming out of um, North Beach, Calvert County and uh, entering the bay here through the, um, the floodgate. Meanwhile, we have Seagate that has been developed uh, and horizons on the bay, the volunteer fire company, wastewater treatment plants, all these are important um, um, assets that are referred to in this draft. And then in the Fishing Creek um, estuary, as I can refer to it, like a mini estuary, but nevertheless, it functions that way. We have a huge uh, wetland complex, tidal wetland complex that uh, stops its natural functions as it enters the channelized part of the um, fishing creek and the urbanized part of the, the area. And so this part of the fishing creek marina, the Callum's field, which is sort of extends beyond this this image, um, the parking lots, all this area is tidal marsh. Uh, 
or at least it was, and uh, it's been urbanized. Um, but as Jay will tell us, the mother nature is reasserting herself there. We have a great deal of subsidence happening. Uh, as I mentioned in the report, um, Jay has seen 16 inches of subsidence over the past 15 years. And Jay, by the way, I, I uh, recorded that information a number of years ago or two years ago when I was doing the comprehensive plan, I recorded it as 18 inches. But in this latest uh, kind of interview I had with you, I have 16. So I have two different numbers. And if we're gonna publish the document, we should make sure I'm correct with the, the right number. So I put that number that out to you. To yeah, yeah, and I would say I would say sixteen, Chris. Got it. Thank you. So, um, so there's some images here that kind of describe the relationships that I just summarized to you, and then there's some description of the floodplain within the uh, the town, uh, and in a more detailed way within the northern part of the town, the South Creek floodplain. And I drew some distinctions between various parts of the floodplain as a way of kind of informing the reader about uh, the base flood elevation and the relative risk between certain areas. So the area that encompasses Seagate and the marsh and the volunteer fire company is at a base elevation of four feet, um, whereas the area that's subject to coastal high velocity wave action, which is along the coast, has a base elevation of, of eight feet, meaning essentially that a structure would have to be elevated eight feet above the mean high or meet the sea level to withstand or to, be, to allow floodwaters to pass under it. Um, then there's a little summary of the wetlands in the community um, and um, uh, a brief discussion of shorelines and a focus on the naturalized shoreline, which is, I wondered whether it's even worth putting this in there since that is the part of the town where we're not even concerned. Um, so I'm, I've, Kind of rethought whether that was a, a wise move. But anyway, it makes a distinction between the urbanized shoreline, which we're talking about in all these other exhibits, you know, and then this more naturalized area south of town. Then there's a discussion of drainage. And when the committee met last time, we hinted at, the, at this a little bit. We were talking about it generally, but we've gotten into quite more detail. Um, and uh, Wayne and Jay, I hope that you'll have a chance to read this if you haven't already, because it kind of distills what we've been discussing during our task force meetings over the past month. And um, I just wanna make sure I got your assessment of the situation accurate. Um, but I, I first started with some discussions of the uh, nuisance flooding. And you might remember we have a, a Chesapeake Beach nuisance flood plan, and that is a data source for this uh, project. And um, excuse me for a second. Okay. Uh, yeah. Someone's asked to be admitted into the meeting. Okay. Um, and there are two photographs of flooding. One on the left is at uh, the, the tot lot near Kellams Field, uh, a nuisance flooding situation. And the other is on uh, Gordon Stinnon Avenue. Um, this is a very common occurrence. Uh, then, but the main, then I made a distinction by the main issues with respect to um, uh, a drainage are systematic, or systematic or, or system-based type of issues that, that really speak to the need for major planning and engineering. Um, and they are the floodgate area of town and um, this photograph shows that the location shows the, the marsh, Seagate, and then the floodgate is up there in the, the background uh, and it describes how it's remain, it remains open, how it, uh, it 
doesn't really function in, to control floods um, and that it really creates kind of a circulation in combination with a pump that is in, in Seagate, in just North Seagate, uh, water is pumped into the wetland. The wetland uh, breaches the highway and the water flows from the highway back to the sump area where the pump works and the pump pumps the water back into the wetland. And this cycle happens uh, during a time where it'd be more advantageous if the water was discharged right to the bay to, to help drain this uh, flooded area. So the, the system that was designed uh, to drain the Seagate area and the area behind it uh, can't really operate effectively. Um, and that is a subject of uh, a lot of discussion that Wayne and Jay are having um, presently. Uh, if you guys want to shed any light on that, guys, uh, please do. I could pause for a minute. I, I feel like you captured it pretty good, Chris, myself. Okay, good. Good to hear I, that. I was going to chime in and say the same thing. So good job, Chris. Oh, good. Okay, so this stop me if I run afoul of anything. Uh, this uh, image here is the view from Seagate from the entrance road. There's a fence you might remember the, along uh, the frontage of the property, the Seagate property looking. And if you stand between that fence, you're essentially in the road, the entryway. And that's about where this photograph was taken. And it was following the October 12th um, tidal flooding event that happened in, in town without any rain, without any precipitation. And what this shows is that the entire road, Maryland 261 is flooded. What you see back here is the pedestrian railing that line, or runs along the, um, the marsh. Um, so the, the system that's kind of evidence that the system's not really working very well uh, and how, and it's a foreshadowing of what the typical um, sea level conditions will be in 2050 when we have a 2.4 foot rise in the base sea level. The, this would, would essentially be the typical condition absent any major intervention. Um, then we went to talk a little bit about the, the, the flood the, or the drainage system that has been installed over time in Chesapeake Beach, it, also in this northern part of the, the town, uh, 29th Street at Veterans Park and Veterans Park. And um, basically, I, I won't read what I have here in, in any detail, but basically the system no longer functions properly. The Corps of Engineers has raised the revetment uh, from roughly 29th Street down and has made it impossible to discharge through that higher elevation wall. In fact, the pipe that was supposed to, that used to discharge at 28th Street, which I'm kind of highlighting here, has been plugged. Um, the lower lying areas behind the higher seawall or higher revetment had flooded and people have taken upon themselves to design their own solutions, to discharge water to low areas, which has caused ponding and other issues. And these issues are only being complicated now when flooding happens. So uh, resolving this issue is, is part of the, the eventual you know, objective of this plan. Okay, so this part of the, the report is still, I'm still preparing it because a series of maps and we've gone through these maps before and on multiple occasions, but that's essentially what this chapter does, it explains the maps and what sea level rise, uh, how sea level rise is making areas vulnerable, just using those, those maps to describe the situation in context. Then chapter four is the action plan strategies and projects. And uh, I'll get through this relatively fast because I don't want to uh, dwell too much on the overall approach, but it's consistent with what we wrote in the introduction that this um, is a complex problem. It's gonna take years of continued work with multiple people 
that this plan is about building the institutional strength and capacity to deal with these issues. And we have time to think about them to ensure that any improvement that is adopted has ancillary benefits or improves other parts of town, that we're not just targeting individual solutions, but we're building and retrofitting the town to be more sustainable and more uh, resilient uh, over the long term. And then as we've kind of, we've kept this kind of process of looking at sub areas, A, B, and C, uh, we don't talk much about area C, but in this report, we have a small part of it. The A being the Northern area, C or B being the central part, and then C being the kind of areas south of the Fishing Creek Marsh near Old Bayside Road. Um, so the plan is basically organized into two major parts. One is what I call strategic flood management and sustainable drainage. And I have five major recommendations here. And these are recommendations that really speak to how development and redevelopment activity are regulated uh, within the floodplain. And to distill this it's at, its, at its heart, it's about broadening the geographic area that will come under floodplain regulations, essentially Z. The floodplain is fairly tightly drawn now. It's the 100 year floodplain and anything with any development, property, development activities, building within that floodplain is subject to certain standards. Outside of the area, you don't have to meet those standards at all. Um, but in light of what we've learned about sea level rise and uh, the increasing vulnerability to areas within uh, the northern part and central part, it it's, just seems incumbent upon us to not ignore that those areas will be at risk in the near future. So this is about essentially a, applying a, a, a zoning and floodplain management framework to areas that today are free and clear of those standards. And there are five different aspects of that. Um, and they're rather technical and candidly, I think a lot more work needs to be done in terms of ordinance writing to make sure that this is effective and, and operationalized. Um, but I, I took time with these, each of these paragraphs to explain the essence of what we be doing. And if this set of recommendations makes it to the council, the town council then would, would advise and direct the, the staff to come up with these solutions in coordination with the town attorney, I'm sure, and, and with Wayne Newton, the town engineer. So, um, so, so please take time to read them if you haven't already. Um, and, and before we get into the second part of the overall plan, which is more project-based, are there any questions about these five things? Did anyone read any of them and, and have concerns or questions about them? Chris, I, I haven't read them yet, but I do have a question. Sure. Uh, you, you talk about floodplain management ordinance and you know the nuisance floodplain stuff. It, I also know you're involved in review of, and I won't say a rewrite, but modifications possibly to the critical area regulations as they relate to within the town at varying from the model ordinance that, you know, like we have, and I don't, I don't know, I follow it completely. I, I've only watched intermittently, but I know there's, do we, do we speak to the critical area ordinance or does that, does that need to be referenced, discussed or tied to this at all? Yeah, you know, I, I've kind of spoke to it in this paragraph without saying the critical area per se. And I think somewhere else in the, this document, I might've mentioned the critical area regulations, but I, I think it's worth bringing out as a, uh, um, more clearly. Um, item four here is about stormwater management practices. And 
stormwater management within these flood zones is essentially critical area compliance. Um, and what our experience has showed us, and I mean, I can specifically point to a project. We, we had a project that um, provided a stormwater management, best management practice approach that um, could not withstand any flooding. And yet it met the strict standards of the, the code, the critical area code and met the 10% rule compliance. It, 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 in other words, it, it was designed to um, absorb phosphorus and keep it from going into area waterways. It was designed to improve the overall pollutant loadings uh, over existing conditions. And yet, while it technically checked those boxes, it, it wouldn't operate in times of flooding. It can't simply, it wouldn't operate when the, the place was inundated. And um, it was at an elevation that made sense if it were far removed from the edge of the water, but up close to the water didn't make sense. So that's what this is getting at. So Jeff, I can build this paragraph up a little bit, reference the critical area uh, standards. It, uh, and, and I wasn't saying it had to, it was just something that crossed my mind as we, you know, as I kind of saw some of the references to other governing documents that you were, you know, that you talk about. Right. And I guess, and I guess the other reason I mentioned it is, I think it's always challenging, you know, as we, as we've gone through the comprehensive plan rewrite and, and all of those things, you know, trying to make sure that while we're doing one thing, it doesn't negatively impact our ability to deal with the resiliency piece or incur, you know, and inadvertently encourage the wrong type of development or, you know, it, it's just those links are really critical between, you know, what restrictions we place on properties in different zones that, and that might drive, uh, you might have a more resilient so solution, but some of our other documents may guide us to, you know, taking up some of the green space or things like that. You know, I just, I think it's important. We, that's something we really, I think, need to look at. Well, that's something we talked about at the, the staff level in the past couple of weeks as we've met and Larry brought this up and, and, um, and or in a, in a, in a way that I, I just latched on and said, yes, exactly. And the, the issue was with respect to building height, the, the, I wasn't going to say that specifically, but 30, yeah, capping at yeah. 35 feet, but not providing allowances for that the measurement to raise with your um, FPE or yeah, with your, your 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 where you establish your your base flood elevation. With base flood is increasing, and we're we're requiring that you have higher freeboard. Uh, we've. And, and if we keep the 35 foot intact, what we've basically done is squeezed down the available living space, which may be a disincentive for people to redevelop the property, which is what we want to do to protect <laughs> public health and safety. So, you know, I, I basically what we said was that the town's gonna have to reckon with this. Um, okay. And uh, because it is that we have basically set up a competing set of objectives that need to be resolved. Okay. Just something I wanted to throw out too. So uh, if I can keep going then, the other aspect, so these are again, five um, kind of major regulatory and approach, planning approaches, zoning approaches that would apply in, in all flood areas within the town. The second section is about tactical retrofitting. It's about making changes to the physical plan of the town uh, gradually over time to become more resilient. So it's more of a project-based type of um, approach. And as a result, it's, you can list the recommendations, one, two, three, four. And, um, and that's what ultimately this, this chapter does. Um, but it begins with reviewing those tactics that we discussed when we met last at the town hall. Attenuate, alleviate, restrict, and realign. Those are just uh, kind of ways of organizing thinking about these approaches with attenuate being 
all about reducing the velocity of floodwaters, increasing the amount of time water takes to flood a, um, a, a target point. And, um, and this is from our standpoint in Chesapeake Beach, this is really about protecting the watersheds. Uh, attenuate is not so much about coastal resiliency, it's more about uh, reducing the impact of water coming out of the higher elevations into the coastal area. And we can do that in part by open space protection, forest preservation, tree planting, and those things. Um, alleviation is about uh, increasing the town's capacity with, to withstand floods, provide areas that can be flooded uh, safely uh, so that we can limit risk everywhere else. Um, and those things include, you know, allowing the marshes to migrate, to grow. That's what they're doing now. And that actually helps uh, contain flooding. Reestablishing wetlands is a, is a concept that communities have done too, but creating spillovers and retention zones for floodwaters, uh, building new landforms to contain the water, like berms, uh, and thereby protect what's on the other side. And of course, the, the drainage solutions, the best management practices, uh, these are all stormwater management uh, related items. Uh, restricting is just really, you know, being the, uh, the defense against the water, holding back, holding the line against flooding is what I wrote. Um, here, we, you know, we have a floodgate, we have seawalls, uh, we have berms, I'm sorry, bulkheads and revetments. And then realign, that's about both changing things vertically by elevating a road, for instance, or elevating a building or changing things horizontally, like relocating houses or relocating a volunteer fire company out of a hazard area or out of an area that would prevent their service from being delivered um, safely. So it's all about repositioning assets. So anyway, the first part of this just describes what I just shared with you. And then we get into area A, focusing on area A first. And um, the big part, I think the most substantive part of this discussion is what happens between these blue lines. Um, this, and I guess we talked about this previously, or maybe it was with the task force, the, the staff task force. Um, everything within these blue lines, generally speaking, wants to be open water at some point. And that's where we're headed. Now there's some exceptions like the volunteer fire company, you have elevations of 12 feet above sea level right then, right now in some locations, the lowest point is eight feet. So this area is, is protected even beyond 2100, it is. The roadway though is, is not, it's at a lower elevation. Um, Maryland 261, uh, drops down. It, you have a high point of about six and a half feet here by Lido's restaurant. Let me make this bigger here. You have a, an elevation about 6.5 feet here and then up here just outside this line of about 6.8 feet. Everything else dips down really low, three, three and a half feet or so. I mean, the roadbed is under the flood stage, the base flood elevation. And um, so that's the context we have. We have the floodgate, we have a community built at low, relatively low elevations that is uh, flooding. And we have some photographs I showed in the document itself that kind of bear this out. By the way, that pump that I was telling you about is located oh, right here, right where my cursor is at the intersection of uh, 31st and C Street. And you have a 460 foot run of pipe discharges to this marsh. It used to be much marsh, much more marshy. Now it's much more open water. Um, flood waters come through the gate, pushes that water out through culverts and you know, back through culverts and over. It floods comes back into this, the sump area, the lower lying areas, uh, and then gets pumped again. So we have this cycle okay. that happens. Um, 
That's what I was referring to earlier. Chris, real quick, that pump station? Yes. That's, is that owned and operated by the town? Yes. But is it on private property? Uh, I believe it is, is on it private easement? property. I don't think it's, I think it might be within an easement, Jeff, but I don't, I don't think it's on public property. Maybe Jay is there ever. Yeah, I was just curious if there's any restrictions on that part, like. Uh, it, restrictions. It, on just to jump in, it is, uh, there's a right of way within those, in those private lots, but it does drain C Street, uh, 31st Street Town Roads. And I think that was the only kind of area to put it without putting it actually in the road. Okay. So we have an easement, I guess for it that sits on this property. Okay, Correct. so there's no chance we'd ever lose, or is, I mean, I guess, is would one of the considerations be finding somewhere else for it, or is it, is it okay there? Or? I, my view of the pump station is, is not so much, Jeff, uh, where it is, it's more of its functionality with it pumping in the circle and the, floodgate thing um it's possible it could be moved to somewhere else but you would still have the same uh problem it, with, if you will of it pumping in a circle right okay so the first part of this um this part of the chapter describes the existing area and its complications uh and it essentially says that the optimal long-term approach to coastal resiliency in this area is to allow to the greatest extent possible the natural functions of the estuary to be reestablished and prevent the introduction of any residential population. Um, so, the, the, and we go on to explain that holding back the water in this area with structures along the bay and or along the marsh is not practical and maintaining the various community facilities that are necessary to maintain for essentially 30 dwelling units, maybe 35 uh, if you count some additional neighborhood residences, candidly may not be worth the public effort in terms of cost to do. So we're really faced with a real dilemma here and how do we maintain the long-term viability of this private community that is surrounded increasingly so by water and hazard. And Chris, kind of Chris, it's Larry. Can I just interject for Jeff's purposes? Please. Uh, one of the things that the uh, work group has discussed is that pump station at 31st and C would actually be more helpful if we were able to discharge into the bay. When that, I understand from talking with Jay, when that was originally constructed, DNR refused to allow that discharge into the bay. They required it to go into the marsh. And that's why we're pumping this water in a circle. And that's why the floodgate really can't operate because as long as we're pumping all that water in a circle, we have to have some exit point for it. So that's one of the things I think the group will have to consider is trying to make an appeal to the state to get it, that discharge rerouted. Thank you. Okay. Um, so what I did here in this, on this page is discuss the basic implications of the reality that exists out there. The reality that this marsh is, wants to be filled in, that walling it off is not possible. And so some of the kind of implications of that to grapple with, these are not recommendations yet, but these are just sort of a discussion of the context. But the implications would be that the volunteer fire company would need to be relocated. Uh, 261 would need to be reconstructed uh, and probably as a bridge over the water. Um, the access route to the water reclamation plant would need to be elevated significantly, you know, in, in pairing with the, the highway, or another access point would need to be found. And that could come through the middle subdivision, the, the residential area. Um, 
just north of 30th Street. So here's the plant. Uh, there's a public road that leads up to this point. Then there's private streets, but they have to be, find a way to connect to the plant through this area one way or the other. If, if in fact, the state could not upgrade this road in a way that kept access to the plant viable. Um, many of the residents on C Street would be surrounded by water on both their bay and street sides and subject to hazardous conditions. At a minimum, C and 31st Street and the right of way would need to be reconstructed and raised considerably. Um, and if I can just switch to something here. Um, so what we're really talking about is, is this area along um, 31st Street and C Street, which is, um, increasingly problematic in light of the, the projected uh, flooding and sea level rise. Um, back to the residents along the north side of the marsh would be flooded and a wide band of homes extending from the marsh would be subjected to hazardous conditions. And here we're, we're referring to, oops, sorry. Bear with me. Um, we're referring to this zone where uh, the marsh is extending northward open water. The marsh that exists now is projected to be open water. Anything at two feet, two and a half feet or below is, is going to be open water. And, um, and you can see that there are quite a few houses along this band that uh, will be increasingly threatened. In fact, the terminus of D Street, David Street, E Street, and these streets, by the way, carry water from First Street and up here. Um, they're, I suspect they're gonna be impassable in the years ahead, in the decades ahead. And fortunately, there is funding through a variety of federal and state programs to uh, allow these people to move out if they choose uh, and their properties can be purchased at fair market value. Um, and it doesn't require recurring flooding damage like FEMA's buyouts do. Chris, Larry, again, if I could yes. just insert a comment here for everyone's, um, on behalf of the town, I have reached out the state highway about the flooding that's occurring along 261. They tell me that they have a study underway. I have no idea when that's going to be completed or what it's going to say, but they are supposedly looking into options to protect uh, Route 261 in the area of the marsh. Thank you. Great. Um, then the townhouses at Seagate are projected to be surrounded by water and the private streets are going to be inundated. And um, I referenced that 20. 22 title event that kind of signals the direction that the community is headed towards. Um, the horizons on the bay has a parking lot that's projected to be underwater uh, and <clears throat> development of any land and intensification of any existing development would need to be strictly avoided. I think this is an important public policy that we need to talk about. Um, there is land available for development within that zone, that ape zone. Uh, and I think it's, I think perhaps the consensus at the staff level, or, or at least um, we've discussed it, is that added development, introducing new population in an area that may actually be underwater uh, may not be the best uh, direction to go in. If there's a way, if there's a way to work against that, possibility, we should. So anyway, those are the kind of the implications of some of the stuff that's happening there and that we project. And the recommendations uh, are listed in the plan. And what I did here is to, and this is very important, that 
The following recommendations are intended for the next 10 years. These are not recommendations for long-term. This is not saying what should happen 50 years from now, but over the next 10 years. And, and even having thought more about it, um, the reality is, is that uh, some of these can, can't be accomplished within 10 years, probably, but the work on them needs to be started within 10 years. And there probably needs to be some progress done within 10 years. Um, so the first recommendations, and I'll just, I've highlighted all the recommendations in an, ab an abbreviated way. First, facilitate the outward migration of the South Creek Tidal Marsh. And that's what we were just talking about. And I'll go down to this exhibit here. Um, this shows the managed retreat line. Managed retreat meaning we, we gradually take up residential properties to allow the, the flooding to come into the area. And people who participate in that will get funding to move out. People that don't are gonna be really constrained in terms of their access to their properties and may ne necessitate the town building and elevating roads and infrastructure that it may not want to do. So the, the strong incentive will be to purchase properties, to move them gradually out of this, this area. This line, the second line is the 2100 line. In other words, everything up to that line um, is projected to be open water by 2100. So that's a longer term perspective. But in the shorter term, this line here defines where water should be um, if the sea level rise projection comes to pass in the shorter term, that 2.4 foot. <clears throat> so going back to the recommendations, Uh, assert public ownership and maintenance of the 20 foot wide historic trolley right of way that runs along 261. And I can go back to this exhibit again. Um, this shows at least part of it. Uh, First Street is up here on the top of this map and then 31st is here. And there's a 20 foot wide strip of land that was uh, acquired and set aside as a right of way for the trolley um, that ran along 261. We don't think the State Highway Administration owns it, and we're not sure who owns it, but we know it's not owned by any individual property owner that faces it, even though a number of property owners over time have built sheds within that area off their property. Um, and that is not an unusual request being the zoning administrator for the town. I've seen uh, people submitting plans for doing just that. And we've had to say, no, no, it's, it's not, it's not your property. You can't build on it. Um, anyway, this area may provide space for flood mitigation and for expanding 261 and elevating 261. That extra 20 feet may be necessary. Uh, to accommodate the upgrade of, two, of the highway. Uh, so um, the town attorney, the, this basically says to the town attorney, we need to go through a quick claim process or some other process to establish municipal control of that right of way or state control. We need, we need to clear things up. Um, then the, going back to the main recommendations, incentivize or require the retrofitting of parking lots in area A. And most importantly is the parking lot at Bay, um, uh, at Horizons on the Bay. Uh, areas that are flooding and are contributing to area-wide flooding uh, can accommodate some flood management on their properties. And it's possible that a concept like this would work on um, Horizons on the Bay. Um, and it may be a, an improvement over the situation that was likely to present itself where, where flood is, flooding is a, more of a continual process. Um, so this is a, points to a recommended solution in the interim uh, in combination with other things like what could happen at the fire department to capture and withstand and withhold, uh, hold back floodwaters. And to allow them to, you know, then be drained more slowly elsewhere. 
Um, four, address the drainage issues at Seagate and the storm drain pump at 31st and C Street. <laughs> this is what Jay was talking about. Uh, we need to hire an, an engineering firm to, to figure this out and see if there's a solution to help this situation in, in the near term. And it might be done in combination with any improvement that SHA would make. Well, I'm sure it would be done in combination with them. I, um, and then there are some recommendations for sub area for area A that we would call restrict, meaning you know holding the line, so to speak. Uh, the first would be to <laughs> elevate the revetment along the bayfront from 30th Street down to 27th Street, and that's essentially this area of Chesapeake Beach, and it encompasses this lower lying area that's subject to the wave velocity that we referred to earlier. And this is about um, developing a, an approach to uh, restore or elevate the revetment or add some type of structure and then behind it, allowing the land to be elevated and the houses to be elevated and the infrastructure to be realigned so that this area can sustain itself over longer term. Uh, if that solution is not accomplished, this area will flood and it will be largely uninhabitable or at least for a number of residents. Uh, and the town has a lot of drainage infrastructure through this area. <laughs> as I mentioned earlier, and that all needs to be reconfigured. So this is a, an important part of the town that um, could be uh, protected. It is not connected uh, hydrologically, I guess if that's the right word, to the, go back to the map, to this zone. We're talking about this area here, this area actually fundamentally drains in this direction. It's part of the, the Southeast watershed. I mean, literally it drains this way or is supposed to drain out to the bay. This area does not flood or drain into um, this neighborhood. So there's a separation between that. There are much higher elevations all through here. So this is kind of a distinct area that can be treated with a, a more defensive solution, but the plan says if there is a raising of the revetment or some type of structure through here, what happens behind that structure is really important. And the two are gonna to have to go together. That there's not gonna be another example of the Corps of Engineers just raising the revetment without fixing drainage and uh, the, uh, the bowl effect that is happening there. <coughs> Wayne, so, am I- So Chris- yeah, so Chris, just a, just a question real quick on that. Is it, would it be possible to raise the revetment in a porous way to, to help with the wave action without creating a bowl effect? You said raise the revetment in, in what type of way? In a porous way, right? Porous so, way. Right, so that you're preventing the wave action, but you're not creating a bowl effect? Uh, well, if it's porous though, you're letting the water through in, come in and, Right, but but like our, our recent problems, like the 2020, October 2022, yes. it was as much about the wave action, um, pushing the water over the revetment and then the drains not letting it back out, which is the bowl effect. But you could solve the wave action problem with a porous revetment that would not, you know, eventually you'd have to get there by 20, you know, by a certain year, but preventing the wave action in the shorter term could solve some problems while you, over the longer term, raise the land and the, and the structures, right? Yes, yes. That's, I think that's, Wayne, we, what's your opinion about that? The, re the revetment we have out there today is porous. Um, the only reason it's not porous is because it's holding the land back behind it. There's a piece of filter cloth holding the land back. Uh, yes, you can raise the revetment, uh, yes, you can raise the land behind it uh, to address all those issues. 
the question then becomes how far do you have to raise the land up to go back how far do you have to go back and that, yes that's all possible um, just a, a thing to consider that's a, it's a significant infrastructure expense and it's probably maybe it's worth it uh, something that uh, we should be considering so um raising the revetment to, to dissipate the energy from the waves can be more of an immediate solution while the longer term plan is to make this more of a functional area for a living uh, right. the drainage and raising the elevation and establishing what grades you should raise to if you're going to redevelop your property and right. laying out a coordinate system there that guides people got it so that is a, a slight revision to what I wrote, wrote here. So let me go back to that uh, section. I'm just going to put a note um, here. Um, Get back to that. <clears throat> Wayne, what is the um, kind of the future for this area if we don't take that type of action? The future of that area will be it'll become open water. Um, certain, certainly significant more flooding uh, than they see today. Uh, as we discussed in our work group, a lot of that area has storm drains that have been plugged or rerouted over the years to raise up uh, or to prevent flooding in that area. Uh, people have raised their yards um, to prevent that flooding. It's just going to continue. You know, the, in my opinion, the, the options are uh, do what we just discussed by raising the revetment and re redeveloping that area or allowing it to go back, just like you talked about up on the northern end or on South Creek. Uh, allow some of that area to go back to an estuary. Um, right. so that's something we have to discuss. Right, right. Do, um, do we want to be as prescriptive as I am here to make the suggestion about the, the wall and figuring this thing out now? Or do we want to leave it open to suggest that this is a possible area for eliminating risk to allowing nature? This is fundamentally different in my view than that area further north of it, but it's certainly an area that's exposed to wave action and it sits lower than its surrounding neighborhood. All of this action. I would agree. I would think this is a, an area that's a prime, a prime candidate for redevelopment and raising. Um, but those are, that's really just the two options. Right. Anybody else have any thoughts on, on this particular aspect of the plan at this point? Chris, it's Jay. My general thought would be, you know, that's, a, that's one suggestion, one thing to prevent wave action. And maybe we need to just leap, you know, put out there all the things we're ex exploring so everything's on the table but we're not at this point i think suggesting or going down any specific avenue does that make sense maybe capture it that is an option um but it's not like we're steering towards any particular thing until i think we get some more feedback am i correct on that or are we trying to go somewhere um well i to incorporate that into this draft I would probably say something to the fact that the other alternative is to allow um, the gradual reemergence of uh, the natural systems through here, allow the waves to come through the porous revetment and to gradually move population out of this risk area. And uh, to the extent that's possible, perhaps in creating a a flood spillover area uh, that somehow may an open space area that may have benefits to the town in the long term. 
Uh, can I just chime in? Um, I don't want to lose sight of the fact that the area we're talking about generally from 29th Street to the south, we're not part of the South Creek drainage. We never have had a, any flooding issue from upland going towards the bay in that area. Not in the 30 years we've been there. I just don't uh, want to lose sight of that. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned it because that's my observation, just not anecdotally, but looking at the maps and, and the elevations. And uh, so what you've just said kind of squares with what I'm, my, my, my understanding too um, of this. So that's why I kind of treated it in a fundamentally different way. In other words, there is a place here that can be targeted with actual defensive mechanisms to, to protect and, and then restore and elevate the land and keep it as a viable place um, for well into the future, which is, I think, markedly different than the Seagate concept where, I mean, I, no matter what you do, as long as sea level rise continues to truck <laughs> forward, um, they're in a precarious position. They've always been in a precarious position. Uh, it's just getting worse. Um, okay, well, um, perhaps the committee can reflect on this again yeah. when you have more time to read it. Uh, and if there's any change that you'd like to make or suggest to this paragraph, please get back to me and Jeff. Um, the other thing is uh, the floodgate, the whole floodgate area, it requires a, a engineering study and a study that I've mentioned it previously, it probably gets done in combination with SHA. Although as Larry said, SHA is apparently working on something for the 261 corridor through there. Um, I would imagine that they need to figure out this floodgate issue in combination with that project because they need to know how high to elevate the road and how if the area-wide drainage is not operating effectively, it's going to affect their design. So um, what I would recommend is that the town get behind doing a, a study jointly with SHA and maybe DNR to, to figure out if it's feasible to, to um, address this floodgate. Maybe the alternative is not to have a floodgate, but to seal it off and use pump or something like that. Or it's a gradual transition into more of a natural based approach up there that's aligned with the land use strategy that move Seagate out of the, the harm's way. Um, those are all complicated recommendations that some of the others are a little more, uh, you can grapple with them a little bit better, um, I think. Uh, the first one would be to ro relocate the volunteer fire company to a safer location. Um, I understand that the fire company itself has acknowledged that this is a possible future for them. And um, so this would be a recommendation that kind of um, signals to the fire company that uh, the town sees that there's a good reason why a new location would be advantageous. Um, reconstructing 261 through the area, um, again, it's a realign, realign recommendation. It's all about elevating the roadway and looks like that is ongoing now, just started. But again, the town doesn't know much about what SHA is thinking. <laughs> we need to pin them down on that. Um, three, use the purchase and removal plan to remove houses located along the north side, as I mentioned, that we'd have to do. So that's an actual recommendation would be to use those funds, that funding. Uh, and I confirmed just yesterday that there is funding and there are a variety of programs that would be uh, eligible for voluntary purchase buyout. Um, for um, amend the zoning area and map to prevent uh, or significantly limit new residential development uh, in the open parcels on A and specifically what we're talking about it on this particular map, you can see it. Um, 
this area here, oh, it's not a very good map. Let's, let's focus on this. I think this will be a better map here. Yeah, so what we're talking about is if you look at this map with the blue lines, it's this green space and this green space. Um, both have been, the land has been elevated relative to the surrounding property, um, but yet it's still in the high risk zone and it's still part and parcel of this wetland complex. In fact, the the older floodplain maps and wetland maps show wetlands on these properties because obviously the highway just bifurcated this bigger wetland. So all of this is uh, one big wetland complex. So um, question for us to grapple with as a community is whether we wanna introduce more population within this, this area. And this recommendation basically says, on balance, we think it's not a good idea to do that. And one approach would be to do a rezoning to make it a resource conservation or some other use, um, which would effectively eliminate residential. But another possibility is to allow the owner to transfer the development potential to other properties that the owner may own within the town or to transfer them to properties that others might own. Uh, so that essentially, if you could do 10 dwelling units, for instance, on these parcels, you would transfer the ability to build 10 more units somewhere else. So it's a transfer of development of rights. And when you transfer the rights off of a property, <clears throat> the property is still there, but it's deed restricted. It becomes permanent open space at that point. And then it could be part of a solution that would help solve this area-wide problem. So that's what that large paragraph that I was just referring to is all about, is how to grapple with that particular uh, area. Uh, and the basic conclusion is um, let's work to substantially limit the number of houses that could be built right there opposite that marsh. <laughs> um, Lastly, I threw this out, and um, because Seagate, um, you know, it's it's conceivable that some residential stays there over the long term. It's quite possible, um, and there are ways of building within flood flooded areas. And uh, here's a an illustration from an architect that shows houses that kind of are anchored to some extent to the surrounding land, but are allowed to float as the floodwaters come in. And while I don't know if the market is right for the, the expensive construction that this must be in the here and now, maybe it's a, an option that would work over the long term. Um, short of that though, it would appear to be very difficult to redevelop the Seagate community long-term. Now, we understand that Seagate is already elevated, I think maybe three feet, um, and it's built on piles. So conceivably, the whole group of townhouses could be elevated on longer piles. Um, I, I guess it's quite possible. <laughs> um, but short of that, the, uh, the community is, is really at risk. I mean, when Isabel came through, it left the underside of the units wet uh, with uh, damage to the insulation of the bottom of the livable space and as the waters passed under the, the project. Um, and that oh, was- Excuse only me, Chris. Yes. Chris, as I mentioned in, in my comments that I, that I sent in, I would challenge that uh, characterization you just made about the, I guess the ceiling, if you will, of the lowest level being wet at Seagate compared to where we are at Baycrest. Because I know for a fact where the high tide mark was during Isabel at Baycrest. 
and it was one foot of my garage door. That's a far cry from touching the ceiling of, of a garage at no, no. Seagate. Bob, Bob, what we're yeah. saying is the um, insulation under the first level, so above the crawl space, that's what got wet. So you don't have a garage as your lowest level? Do not. You do not. Okay. I'm staying corrected. Sorry. I thought you had a garage level. I should know. I wish I did. In there. I wish I did, but no. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. No, that, and you wonder why, um, because the given that location, that technique wasn't used there. But yeah, you've got a livable space just a couple of feet off the ground, three feet off the ground at most. Uh, um, okay, then there's area B. Oh, I, I, anyway, before we go to area B, and I won't belabor this too long, are there any other comments on this first area? Anything else that, in over the next 10 years that the town should really be focusing on that we haven't mentioned. Chris, I think as we dive into this and spend a little more time reading it, we might have some ideas. So uh, yeah. You okay. know, I think uh, I think it's good to hear what how how you laid this out and what your thoughts were. I think we're gonna need some time to kind of really think about what you have written and maybe some other I'm I'm sure I'll have some other thoughts that uh, pop up as I'm reading through it. Great, okay. So let me keep trucking along here on uh, area B um, in the same way it was organized with area A, there's a description of the vulnerabilities and the context and some mapping. Um, um, this one really highlights the, the, the extent of private uh, shoreline protection, namely bulkheads uh, that have been established already through the area, some more mapping here. And, uh, then, and then again, the recommendations for the next 10 years and using the same uh, organization, attenuate, and attenuate is really about land preservation in the Fishing Creek watershed. And here we're you know, obviously talking about the Fishing Creek watershed, which extends well beyond the town. It's quite extensive. And fortunately it's mostly very low density rural protected land preservation areas, and we need to encourage the county make, to maintain that future, uh, to, to lower the amount of impervious surface that can be built in that watershed. Um, and to protect any remaining forest areas that drain to Fishing Creek. Then in terms of alleviate uh, recommendations, the big one that I thought was most relevant is the treatment of Kellum's Field and Kellum's Recreational Complex. <clears throat> and I included some exhibits in the, the, the document to explain the notion of a blue-green type of park um, or an approach to flood management. Essentially, this exhibit here illustrates it. In 2050, all of this is projected to be open water. The marsh is projected to be water. This area here on the north side is a lower elevation and that's shown as, as open water too. So what's behind that open water then is at relatively low elevations still, but uh, could be protected by some type of elevated land form, a berming or some other approach, uh, leaving space for the park in a more traditional sense um, but also leaving space for spillover so the water can flood over the long term in a park type of setting and then slowly discharge back to the, the fishing creek or the bay. Um, but it basically seeks to help uh, allow the park to remain effective long term, but also create a, a buffer to the waters that are coming in from the west. They're also coming in through Fishing Creek Marina, of course. Um, so what the private property owner does in terms of securing that marina is going to be pretty important. In other words, raising the seawall to contain the water uh, because that water will come into the park that way as well. Um, so the basic idea is to, to do a kind of a landscape uh, design, nature-based solution to create a kind of 
a park like the one you see here with open water berms uh, and flat surfaces for recreation. Um, then restrict type of recommendations. Um, the plan assumes that property owners will continue to maintain and as needed elevate the bulkheads that line Fishing Creek to secure their marinas and, and commercial properties. Uh, without that, those properties do flood. Uh, and while most of the flooding would be contained on those properties, some flooding would extend beyond them, as I mentioned, near Kellum's Field. Um, what I'm suggesting is that the town council reestablish the, the, the town's board of port wardens to provide oversight. That's what the board of port wardens has been structured to do. It's set forth in the, it's actually in the zoning code as a separate article in the zoning code that deals with this board of port wardens. And it's probably a good idea to have a, a body operating in town reviewing the changes to the structures that line the, 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 the marina and the inlets. Um, in terms of windward keys, uh, the plan assumes that windward keys will defend against the water by building seawalls and, 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 and other structures and improving their revetments. Um, if I could just go back to a map here. Here is the, well, here's the 2100 sea level change pro projection of 5.8 feet. Um, and we're looking at area B, the center of town. Uh, windward keys can, with structures, contain the water along its perimeter. And uh, so this plan basically says to windward keys, uh, doing that would be a supportable, supportable approach, one that can help secure your property. Um, Windward Keys is not influenced directly by the water that comes from the west, from the uh, wetland, from Fishing Creek, as much as the coastal water coming over its revetment and filling in of this area. I mean, even this is 2100, assumes almost a six foot sea level rise and still most of it's contained within the, the channel already. The roads themselves are at lower elevation. So water is coming in. Um, and so a, a, some type of approach would be necessary to secure that. If it did secure that water, it would help prevent the flooding of Town Hall. Here's Town Hall at 26th Street and Bayside. This area, the front, the front lawn of uh, the Town Hall is uh, projected to flood in the future. And it floods now. It, it, it was underwater at Isabel. You know, some photographs of that that we have. So um, going back to the recommendations, relocate the re realign recommendations. Again, kind of repositioning things. Relocate Northeast Community Center. It's in a flood hazard area. It's at a lower elevation than a lot of properties around it. It's next to the, the um, Boat landing, it's uh, it's elevated several feet off the ground, um, but its access and its viability long term are, are really questionable. Study the feasibility of ele elevating Gordon Stinnett Avenue. This is complex because really we have two property owners that would benefit from that, and um, let's go to a 2050 map. Here's Gordon Stinnett. We have the Fishing Creek Marina and we have the courtyards um, at Fishing Creek, the apartments and townhouses. This is all owned by one entity and the marina is owned by one entity. Otherwise, everything else is public back here. And the road itself starts at about 5.5 foot elevation up by Gott's um, gasoline station and it drops down to 2.5 uh, 
right through here. And that's where the critical zone is in terms of flooding and entry of water actually into the park. So um, the, the question that the town faces is, will it elevate this road and go through that expense to elevate it? And if so, does that elevating road provide part of a, a buffer? Uh, is it elevated in a way that it becomes a seawall essentially? Um, and what's the future of this neighborhood back here? Because if this neighborhood is not viable long-term, does the town want to go through the expense of building and maintaining this public street um, if it's not really providing access to, to this neighborhood? Because the park can be accessed through the first part of this road or the park can be accessed through this public right of way as well, you see? So um, the park doesn't depend on this low lying section of roadway that is a source of nuisance flooding now. Jay, do you have anything to add to this this particular topic? Sure, and yeah. and it it goes back, Chris, to uh, and just for everyone in the room, some knowledge. The, most of all of that is swamp, organic material. So the the community center and the uh, water park were built on piles. In other words, they're not moving, they're not sinking. So my reference points where I'm saying it's sinking. If anyone drives down Gordon Stennett and you look south to the stamp concrete, which is about 11 years old now, it's already sunk six or so inches compared to where it was level with the park. And if you went into the circle between the community center and the park, at the same time frame, about 10 years ago, we redid all that stamp concrete and it's already sunk eight inches. So my point in that area, not only sea level rise, but that entire area has organic material that my thought is, is decomposing and sinking and, and you know flood rise on top of it. And I think that's unique in that area versus some of the other areas where it's hard ground. Just wanted to share that with the room. And does the same thing apply to the right of way of, of Gordon Stinnett Avenue? It does. And, and, and particularly the uh, courtyards the buildings are piled, but all that infrastructure and everything is sinking and uh, yeah. showing signs of, of failing already. Right, right. And those areas are quite low. I mean, if you look at point D there, there's a, in the 10% 10 10 annual chance flood, we're expecting 1.7 feet of standing water uh, in the more traditional 1% flood 2.3, 2.4 feet of water uh, in that area. So this is by 2050, um, but longer term, the 2100 maps show this area is underwater, a lot of it. Um, so the road could be reconstructed though, it could be built on piles, right? Yes, it could. Wayne? Yes, it can be it can be reconstructed to, to be raised. Yeah. Yes. So it, it's it's possible to to reconstruct that road on on piles in the same way that the buildings were reconstructed or, or constructed. <clears throat> um, okay, go back to the uh, number three is kind of related to number two, and it's consider relocating the courtyards at Fishing Creek. Now this is a, a low income housing development and it's providing a, a very vital need uh, to the community. Um, it was built in 1989, but it was built within this marsh zone. And what we're seeing is that access and the, the landscape around it has become real problematic. I think we have to, over the next 10 years, really decide if this is sustainable long-term, if there's a, an option to relocate these residences to another location within the town so that we have the affordable housing component within the community uh, still, but we're, it's not exposed out here in this low-lying flood zone um, that is projected over the longer term to be all that dark is open water, you see? So, there be a, needs to be a lot of infrastructure work to make sure that this area is accessible long-term. And even if it is, it's still subject to a 10% annual chance of 
of major flood events. Uh, by the way, this spoil site uh, really acts as a kind of a buffer. It holds back some water that would otherwise flood the, the community. Um, and then the plan goes on to say, number four, redesign the boat landing, uh, the public boat landing. Right now, uh, with the way the water has come up and the land has subsided, uh, it's increasingly become unusable. So it probably needs to be dug out deeper and um, perhaps moved in, inland too. I, I'm not quite sure, but uh, Jay, that's a, a specific project that uh, it's good to have in this plan because it makes it eligible for state's funding. Uh, and I, I assume that the town would want to uh, fix that boat landing. I would agree that's definitely in the town's interest to have that uh, a town asset, yes. Okay, yeah. So that, that, the, those points take us through sub area B uh, over the next decade. And then with respect to sub area C, it's just a, kind of a brief mention really. And it's, um, here's Fishing Creek and the wetlands behind it. Um, and it's about really um, keeping abreast of these changes and ensuring that if such time as the septic systems that are uh, attached to these houses fail, the town is aware of it, and it might mean that the town uh, then has another reason for extending municipal sewer treatment to these lots, which is part of the long-term plan. It's discussed in the sanitary sewer manual that the town has, um, but increasingly those lower lying houses, you can see, I hope you can see the small boxes, the, the houses, these lower lying boxes um, are kind of close to what will be open water. And as, as it turns out, the open water is largely contained within the 100 year floodplain. But we know that when marshes become open water, uh, things happen outside of the, uh, on the, you know, the upland area like, like groundwater infiltration and marsh migration. And so the, the septics here may face issues moving forward. That's really all I have to mention about item or area C um, because they're not in any direct threat like the, some of the other parts of Chesapeake Beach are. And that's all Jeff that I have to present tonight. I appreciate it, Chris. There's a lot of information. I think there's a lot for us to kind of dig into. So I would ask uh, anybody on the steering committee to spend some time uh, reading through that and then sharing comments. And then I think uh, we're gonna need to find a time and we can get back together and, and discuss that. You know, I think we, we should collect those comments. We should talk about them. And then we need to probably present something to you, Chris, back as a group uh, sharing those thoughts. Uh, so I got to think about when, when we could get the, you know, get some, collect those comments back and then co bring, come together to talk about them. Okay. Bob, by the way, thank you for sending that email this afternoon. I haven't gone through all the, the comments, but I, I will make all those changes. I appreciate that. You're mm -hmm. most welcome. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so Chris, what I, Chris, what I think I'll do is I'll spend some time or we can maybe just collecting my thoughts on uh, how much time, we, you know, just lay out some things in my head of when we think we can get stuff back to you. And then maybe you and I can talk about uh, what the next step looks like. And then, and then I'll set, yeah, I'll coordinate with, I'll coordinate with the steering okay. committee on how we do that in the timeline. Okay. I, Jeff, I wanted to mention that um, Holly intends to schedule uh, an opportunity for me to brief the town council on 
July 11th at their meeting. Okay. Okay. Um, obviously, this is not your recommended plan. I mean, I mean, it's got work that's necessary to do, and um, but she wants me in front of the council to give them an update and a briefing on it. So, um, you want me to be there with you? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Yeah, that would be very helpful. Um, and it may be that it's a, a type of meeting where we do this type of thing over the internet. Um, but we'll see. Okay. Let's talk some more about it. Okay. Any questions from anybody else on the steering committee before we wrap up tonight? Hearing on. Thanks uh, to everybody on the working group. I know you all have spent a lot of time with uh, Chris and Holly and everybody, you know, and then some of the other uh, staff, you know, that you have that have been helping you on this. I appreciate you collecting a lot of the data over uh, the last year to, to pull this together. Uh, I think we're making good progress on kind of laying out maybe some approaches that we can uh, push forward. Uh, and I know it was a you know, and although it's kind of damp and dark tonight, I appreciate everybody staying on a little bit longer than we had scheduled. And uh, I'll reach out to you soon. Thanks. Okay. Thank you, everybody. Good night. Take care. Thank you. Good right, so long, everybody. Thank you. Good night. Good night. <clears throat>